I'm excited about chapter five. Um, I used to hate reading this part of the Bible uh, because chapter five, I just could not make sense of it. Um, it was one of those passages where nobody wants to preach on it. Nobody wants to talk about it. And those who have preached on it often have come from very strange angles, uh, you know, where I'm pretty sure if you, if you know this story, especially the beginning of chapter five, you've probably heard it in the context of a pastor saying, hey, you know what happens when you lie to your pastor, you know, Ananias and Sapphira or, uh, you know, these kinds of, of comments and jokes. And, um, and I think they're really funny, but they're probably not very helpful in terms of uh, understanding what's actually going on. But uh, I, uh, I've been so touched and ministered to by this passage of scripture, especially in, in my own individual pursuit of the glory of the Lord. And as a church, as we've begun to position ourselves as a people uh, of his presence, um, when you read scriptures like this, they actually, they light something up inside of you that they don't cause fear, they cause hunger. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to read chapter five, and I'm, I'm going to read it and, and teach it in parts, because there's kind of a few things that happen in this chapter. So we're just going to do the first part, and then we'll do the, the next and then the third. So uh, for now, we're going to read uh, Acts chapter five, verse one to verse 11. So let's read it, and then we'll unpack it, and then uh, we'll go from there. So I'm going to read tonight. I'm, I'm in the Amplified, um, so that you might find I say a few extra words. That's okay. Um, whenever I uh, go into like some of the hectic parts of the Bible, I enjoy the Amplified because it just gives me a little bit more explanation, which helps me freak out a little bit less. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to read from the Amplified and uh, just kind of bear with me. Okay, chapter 5, verse 1. Now a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's full knowledge and complicity, he kept back some of the proceeds, bringing only a portion of it and set it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and secretly keep back for yourself some of the proceeds from the sale of the land? As long as it remained unsold, did it not remain your own to do with as you pleased? And after it was sold, was the money not under your control? Why is it that you've conceived this act of hypocrisy and deceit in your heart? You have not simply lied to people, but you've lied to God. And hearing these words, Ananias fell down suddenly and died. And great fear and awe gripped those who heard of it. And the young men in the congregation got up and wrapped up the body and carried it out and buried it. Now, after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me whether you sold your land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how could you two have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. And at once she fell down at his feet and died. And the young men came in and found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear and awe gripped the whole church and all who heard about these things. <laughs> now, I don't know about you. You read that that is, whew, amen. I'm encouraged. I'm excited. <laughs> who reads that and goes, yes, pumped about <laughs> uh, church on Sunday. It's going <laughs> to be wild. Now, you read that and it's pretty scary, right? We read scriptures like this and you go, whoa, hold on a second. Why is this in the Bible? Why did God put this in the book of Acts? Why was this recorded? What are we supposed to learn from this? What is the Holy Spirit trying to teach us? And I want to just take you back a little bit because I believe that, that uh, so we know the Bible wasn't written in, in, in chapters. It was letters, right? So they weren't split the way that we have it now. So in other words, you didn't just read chapter four. Uh, if you were reading the letter, you generally read the letter. So I think it's important to quickly jump to Acts chapter 436, which is the introduction of Barnabas, or his real name was Joseph. And it says this, now Joseph, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, who was uh, surnamed Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, sold a field belonging to him and brought the money and set it at the apostles' feet. So it's important for us to know that the story of Ananias and Sapphira is, is explained straight after the introduction of a man named Barnabas who sold the, field, sold the field and laid it at the apostles' feet. There is a clear comparison of two spirits that are operating here, and, and that's what in this letter is being made clear. So if we read scripture out of context, we can take a story on its own outside of the context that it was written in and, and actually what was happening in that moment that we can misunderstand what the Lord wants to say. So if you read the story of Ananias and Sapphira outside of the context of Barnabas, you'll misunderstand why that was brought into the letter of Acts. 
You with me? So Barnabas, we, we, we're going to hear more about him later on as we go throughout Acts, but he ends up being a really profound and influential character uh, in the, the, the growth and the uh, explosion of the church into the Gentile world, and he works alongside Paul. And Barnabas, I believe, um, when I look at scripture, actually was like a spiritual father to Paul. And if you don't get a guy like Barnabas, you don't get Paul because Barnabas fought for the destiny that God had set Paul uh, to walk in. And when Barnabas was given opportunities, which we see in Acts um, 11, he actually recognized that, that he wasn't called to run alone, but that he could bring sons and daughters into that opportunity, cause them to stand on his shoulders and go way beyond what he actually ever did. And so Barnabas is an amazing man. And we're introduced to Barnabas simply by seeing his heart. And his heart was not looking for uh, pulpit title, influence, opportunity, any sort of self agenda or self gain, but simply was somebody that had encountered the worthiness of Jesus. And because he had encountered the worthiness of Jesus, he was able to sell a field without any hidden agenda of what, what was to happen with the proceeds, but laid it at the apostles' feet with a complete trust in the governance of God upon the, the body and the church, and simply wanted to worship Jesus with his whole life. That's essentially what you're seeing in the life of Barnabas, was a man fully taken by the wonder of Jesus, fully given to the gospel, given to the kingdom, uh, fully in alignment with the, the vision and the mandate of why Jesus birthed the church. And he's saying, everything that I am, I will give to this one thing. And that's the simplicity of Barnabas. And I want to say to you, we'll unpack this later, but it's that very heart that qualified Barnabas for nations. It's that very heart that qualified Barnabas to unlock cities that would unlock other regions. And uh, it's, it's, it's the simplicity of a, of a worshiping heart. It's the Mary of Bethany company of people who are prepared to waste their lives on Jesus, right? Which I, I almost want to preach that again, but we, we will get there in Acts chapter 11 when we unpack Barnabas a bit more. But now we begin to look at this comparison because you've got the same mechanics in terms of the, the story. Here's a, a couple who also sell a field and they also sell a field and they, they, they also want to participate in what's happening. There's a movement of God exploding on the earth. Signs, wonders, and miracles are breaking out in the church. God is doing something incredible and there's a desire in their heart to participate. The only differences which we begin to see is that it was not everything. They did not give their whole hearts. They, this was not an act of worship. This was an act of desiring to be a part of something on their own terms. I hope that makes sense. Here was a couple that was saying, wow, I'm seeing something powerful happening before my eyes. I'd really love to be a part of this, but I want to be a part of this on my own terms. I want control. I want influence. I want uh, an opportunity to, to uh, you know, kind of have some sort of benefit from this situation. And so sometimes we see this giving a lot of times people give for political gain or we give for influence or we give for uh, opportunity or to make uh, or to try and open a man-made form of, of favor uh, to get an in with uh, whether it's leadership or whether it's friendships or whether it's business or all these different things, right? And so we see this happen here where they sell a piece of their property and they, they together make a decision to keep back some of the proceeds. And they bring only a portion of it and they set it at the apostles' feet. Now we see something incredible, which we'll unpack a little bit more as we go through chapter five. But Peter is walking in such an anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit that he actually, by word of knowledge, can see what's happening in this situation and can deal with it under the glory and power of the Holy Spirit. And so he recognizes through divine revelation, word of knowledge, that this is going on. There's deceit and hypocrisy in their hearts, right? And so he asked them, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and secretly keep back for yourself some of the proceeds? Interesting statement that Peter makes. He actually says, why have you allowed Satan to fill your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? I, said, I just want that. That's some seriously uh, harsh words because we are talking about somebody that still sold the field. So are you with me? This, these, this is a couple that actually still sold the field. In today's church world, we would still look at that, celebrate that and say, oh my goodness, radical generosity. They sold an asset and actually even gave some of that money to the church. <laughs> to us, that would be, wow, amazing. It just shows you the standard and 
and, and level of our Christianity and our Christian walk where we've settled for things. But here, because Peter recognizes this by word of knowledge, he says, Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself proceeds. As long as it remained unsold, did it not remain your own to do with as you pleased? Here's Peter saying, hold on a second. God doesn't need your money. <laughs> God's after your heart, right? God's after the, the hearts of men and women, children of God. So he's saying, hold on. The land was yours. You didn't have to sell it. You didn't have to, to give it up. God's after your heart. So he didn't need your money. He was looking for your heart to co-labor with you. So while it was still your own, you could do with it as you pleased. Why would you sell it and then lie and keep some of the proceeds? He says, and after it was sold, was the money not under your control? Why is it that you've conceived this act of hypocrisy and deceit in your heart? Why? He's saying, why would you, why would you sell the land in the first place if the reality is your heart was never free from that money anyway? Why would you sell the land under the guise of participating in a movement that's all about radical obedience and laying down your life for Jesus? Why would you try and perform the act without the heart and think that that would be okay in his glory? It's really profound when you read this and you go, whoa, hold on a second. This is a statement to the church of the level of Christianity that Jesus paid for, the level of our walk with the Lord that, that, that Jesus made a way for us to come into, that it was our whole lives. I said it on Sunday, when you're madly in love with Jesus and fully taken by him, then the natural response is radical obedience. See, when Jesus is worthy and worthy of more than your song, but worthy of your life, then it's not a question about whether I should give the, the proceeds or not. If he's led you to sell the land, it's his anyway, right? And so here's Peter questioning, hold on a second, what's the motive here? Why, why would you do this? You want to participate in something with a selfish agenda for your own gain, but the reality is you're not truly a part of this movement anyway. There's a, there's a clear distinction here of what the church is and why there is this expression of radical generosity. This isn't just about a whole bunch of people that suddenly uh, felt you know, hey, well, it'd be a good idea to start selling some things and sow a bit of money into the church. No, this was a movement of yielded lovers of God that gave their whole lives to something. And so Peter's making it real clear, hey, we're not asking for a whole bunch of services to line up and donate a little bit of money to a cause. See, when we settle for that as the church, we miss the power of the gospel and his glory upon the church, because the reality is he wasn't looking for financial support so that, well, somehow we'll figure out how to get what God wants done. No, this was actually about the hearts of the people of God. And he was saying, we are a, a movement, a people that exists to give him everything for the purposes of his glory. God never, God never forced you to sell your land. He's given you an opportunity to co-labor with him. And it's the lovers of Jesus that will come into that kind of radical generosity and obedience, sell what they have, lay the proceeds at the apostles' feet for the glory of God. It's really profound. Then it says, um, you have not simply lied to people, but to God. And hearing these words, Ananias fell down suddenly and died. And great fear and awe gripped those who heard of it. And the young men in the congregation got up and wrapped up the body and carried it out and buried it. There is a level or a weight, a measure of glory upon the church when it's, when it's living in the purity of the gospel. I mean, just picture this. We haven't seen, you know, people say to me, kind of, well, why have we not seen, you know, that kind of uh, weighty glory where, you know, people could die in his presence? Well, well, I don't think we've been as close to this kind of glory ever since. But the reality is this. God does not have an intention to kill people. <laughs> he wouldn't go and give uh, his son and, and pay the price that he did, only to have an intention to just wipe out the church because of their hypocrisy. No, this was a divine sign and a wonder to the people of God where the, the, the principle, the value of his kingdom was being expressed. He is the king of glory. You know, my dad mentioned it on Sunday. He is the judge. He's the righteous judge, and, and we will stand before him one day, and I think it's easier to relate to him and connect with him as, you know, uh, you know Jesus, my older brother, or high priest, or loving Abba Father, and, and these things, and, and the nurturing, comforting Holy Spirit, and we love those things that are profound and powerful, but we do struggle often when it comes to the fact that he's king of glory, he's ruler of the nations, he's the great judge, uh, he's going to judge the earth. And he, and he will do it in perfection and in righteousness. 
And so when we, when we think of him in that way, that's why in today's modern Western church, we struggle with the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God is a concept that really confuses us because what we want is actually to be in control. So sovereignty has no context to land in the minds of a people that want to be in control. <clears throat> That's profound. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> good, good word. <laughs> it's really true. And, and so here what we see is there's a weight of glory that comes upon the church. And there's a sign and a wonder that actually happens because this, uh, this is the first time it's mentioned that this uh, kind of duplicity spirit, this hip hypocritical spirit comes into the movement, comes into the family of God, and God deals with it in a certain way to reveal that actually, let me make it very clear what you're a part of. Let me make it very clear what we mean when the glory of God is upon the people of God, when the, when the presence of Jesus is upon his people. What actually is the fruit and result of that is the purity of the gospel. It's not a casual, blase, easygoing, if I want to be a part of this, I get to choose how and when and what and why. No, you don't. If you want to be a part of the movement of the house of God, what it requires is a death to yourself and the resurrection life of Jesus to come alive in you where the natural response of every son and daughter is radical obedience to say yes to Jesus, to follow him. He's not just worthy because somebody told me he's worthy. He's because I've seen him. And because I've seen him, I cannot help but give him everything. See, if we want to be a people of his presence, eyewitnesses of his glory and his power, then what that produces in us is a radical response that is so not of this world. It is so not of this natural realm that it freaks people out. And we'll see that, that it says that people dare, they dare not just join them. See, this is, this is the kind of radical obedience in the church that makes it hard for people who know that they couldn't live that kind of yes to Jesus. It makes it hard for them to just join. It makes it hard for them to just come in and go, oh, no, I think I think I can kind of fit in here. It's okay. I feel comfortable. And yeah, I can sow, uh, you know, when I have some extra cash and I'm happy to give a little bit when I've got some spare. And, and the reality is so much of the Western church has settled for this kind of Christianity and it's not in the Bible. In fact, what I see in the Bible is actually apostles and fathers and mothers and uh, leaders in the church that hold a high standard of obedience, a high standard of what it means to be a Christian. And any time, it's not legalism to say that actually, uh, just because I, you know, I, this is, let, let me put it this way. When people say, no, man, when you hold that high standard, that's legalism, you're putting pressure on us to be something. No, it's not. It's just making it very clear what we are. It's making it very clear what a Christian is. It's making it very clear what somebody who has given their life to Jesus lives like. And I think what we've got to understand is that as the people of God, it's not legalism to preach the gospel in purity because it's the grace of God that enables us to live that anyway. So we know it's not our own strength. We know it's his righteousness. We know it's his grace. But let's make sure that we have awakened our, our, our hearts and our minds to see clearly what we are becoming. We need to make sure we're beholding the true gospel. We're not beholding something in our own image that makes us feel comfortable to be a part of something that's way below the standard of what Jesus paid for. I know this is intense, but if you hear me tonight, it's actually liberating. Yeah. When, you, when you hear the word in this way, it's, it is intense and it does cut us to the heart. But the reality is it's liberating because what it does is it, it invites you into the supernatural life. Yeah. See, the church and the gospel has to be supernatural or it's not the church. Yeah. See, if Jesus, who is literally, uh, he is supernatural. Jesus is where anything of, of the, 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 the life of the spirit, it flows from Jesus. So if we're going to live a supernatural life, it's in Jesus. And if Jesus is the one building the church, then it can only be a supernatural people. Mm -hmm. We cannot be built on any other systems, any other mindsets, any other way. When the glory of Jesus is upon the church, when we behold his face and the Shekinah glory of heaven is upon the people of God, it looks like something. And it looks like something very clear, very simple, but powerful. And so that's why you go, it doesn't make sense for a guy like Barnabas to just sell one of his assets and just, just give all the money. I mean, did he not think about the effect that that'll have on his life? And what about his future? And what about the things that he had planned for? And I guarantee you that the, if he had an asset, an extra asset, extra piece of land, there was purpose and a dream and a goal and reasons why he had bought that piece of land. And, and I guarantee you that it actually had value to him. It wasn't like, yeah, oh, I, I have an extra piece of land just sitting somewhere that I just, yeah, sure, you can have that. No, it's not like that. You know, the reality is, and this is what's important for us, is that these things matter to us. And that's why it's beautiful. 
It's beautiful because they're things that represent your dreams and your goals and your aspirations. And you're saying, Jesus, you are more worthy to me than my own dreams, aspirations, and goals, than the things that I thought I was living my life for. When I've given my life to you, I'm prepared to give you everything. And it's actually my joy to worship you by taking those things and laying them at the apostles' feet, laying them at your feet, Jesus. And so we see the same thing happens with his wife, with uh, Sapphira. And, uh, and you can read through that. But I find one thing that jumped out to me is that, um, you know, when, when he asks her, did you sell the land for so much? She says, yes. And then Peter said to her, how could you two have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? And it reminded me of Jesus in the wilderness. When Jesus' response to the enemy is, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And I thought, whoa, that's, that's really interesting that Peter refers to them testing the Lord here. And it's not testing the Lord like, well, let's just see if, if God comes through. But it's testing the reality of, of, of the purity of the gospel and the weight of glory upon the church. It's testing, well, is, you know, hey, we, we, preach, a, we, we preach a big sermon, but, but actually, is it, is it real? And, and, and my participation, you know, it can be limited because, well, let's see. Let's see what happens. And the reality is actually, don't do that. <laughs> it's God's church. It's his house. He's the great shepherd. And, and he's, if he's building his church, I think it's a good idea just to start building what he's building, start putting your hands to what he's building, rather than actually see if he really meant what he said. And there's so much more in that, and I, I could go down that, but I, for the sake of time, I, I won't. But I'd encourage you to read that and go back to Luke chapter 4 and read Jesus in the wilderness and just begin to compare those two, two things there. If you want to just quickly jump with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 verse 17 is the story of the rich young ruler. And I want to just use this and, and I'm also going to use um, the short little story of Nathaniel as well. And just use them as, a, as comparison stories to Ananias and Sapphira to bring a little bit of clarity and understanding. So let's read Mark chapter 10 verse 17. It says, as he was leaving on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked God, or asked him, sorry, good teacher, you are essentially good and morally perfect. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? That is eternal salvation in the Messiah's kingdom. I want to just point something out to you before we move on. As Jesus is leaving on his journey, listen to this, a man ran up and knelt before him, right? Here's a man who runs up to Jesus, falls at the feet of Jesus on his knees and asks him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So before we've even moved on, you know, if you're one of the disciples, your first impression of this guy is a worshiper. Your first impression of this guy is somebody who's hungry, somebody who wants to know, he wants to, his question is, how do I enter eternal life? He comes, he falls at the feet of Jesus. Then listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? Now, Jesus isn't saying he isn't good. Jesus is just testing okay you just called me good teacher why do you call me good what's your definition definition of goodness what's your perspective of goodness in this situation so he says why do you call me good no one is good except god alone in other words jesus is saying i'm not good because I, i'm a good teacher i'm good because i'm the son of god you hearing what i'm saying so he's just he's bringing clarity to goodness here he's saying hold on i'm not good because i'm a, I'm a great speaker and i've got some good wisdom and i might have an answer for you i'm good because i'm god just a little paradigm shift that Jesus brings into the situation. He says, you, uh, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not testify falsely, do not defraud, honor your mother and father. And he replied to him, teacher, I have carefully kept all these commandments since my youth. Looking at him, I love this. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love, a high regard and compassion for him. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all your property and give the money to the poor. And you will have abundant treasure in heaven. And come, follow me, becoming my disciple, believing and trusting in me, walking in the same path of life that I walk. But the man was saddened at Jesus' words, and he left grieving because he owned much property and had many possessions, which he treasured more than his relationship with God. As we cultivate relationship with Jesus, there's going to come a moment where you're confronted with the reality of, do you have possessions or do your possessions have you? 
And I believe this. I want to say this to you. Every single believer, no matter how much you have, will come to this point in your walk with Jesus. You will come to a point where this, this challenge will come. And I, I want to say it like this. I'll bring it into the context of, of nations and missions as well. It's the same way that every single believer must ask the question, am I called to go into the nations or to go into a place where the gospel has not been preached? Because the reality is you, you might not be called to, to go to that, that specific nation or that specific place, but you are called to be willing. You are called to be available. You are called to ask the question. It's the same thing with your finances. You go, well, no, God's actually called me to business. He's called me to be a really wealthy person to reach wealthy people. Well, ha have you come to a place where that's been tested? Have you come to a place where the Lord's actually tested that heart and, 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 and you've come to the place where you could, you could really ask the question, test your, can I, is it, do I have possessions or do possessions have me? Can I give it? Can I release it? Can I sell everything and, and obey God? I, I'm just saying this because it's important because what we have is often we have this, this divide and the separation between people who give Jesus their yes, prepared to sell everything and go and be a missionary. And then you get entire movements birthed out of that mentality, which I believe is so God. And then you've got this other side where you've got people that are so preaching the prosperity of God, but they never ask the question as to whether God's actually asked them to sell everything and, and, and go. And I, I believe the Lord wants to bring into the church this, this healthy marriage of that. It's not that either of them are right and wrong, but the, the reality is the heart journey that happens in our relationship with Jesus, where everybody must come to a place where Jesus is worthy of giving absolutely everything, everything that you are, where you're prepared, you hold things so loosely that if one day you had a million rand and the next day you said, give it away and go to the, 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 the mission field in the Middle East or the uh, towns in uh, Africa, whatever, whatever it is, but you're, you're willing and you're available to say yes to him and whatever he calls. If he said to you, sell all your things and give it to the poor, come and follow me. Is the response of your heart, yes. Now, I know, you know, when I, when I preach this, it's like sometimes the, the question is like, well, no, you know, why not everybody's called to that. So why do you have to put that on people? I'm not putting it on people. I'm just making sure that our heart journey with Jesus is in purity, where we're journeying with the Lord to say, Lord, am I actually in a place of saying yes and following you no matter what? No matter what, is there things in my life that actually I have justified as uh, to be legitimate in my life that are now obstacles to my yes? I know, I know this, is, this is a little bit heavy, but it's just the reality. The reality is sometimes we don't even realize that we've fallen in love with comfort and we've used it to justify things in our lives. And we even uh, justify it as, well, I'm called to these things. And so it must be that God wants me to have them. It's called presumption. I spoke about it on Sunday. It's when people are led by presumption, which is uh, taking something, an idea to be true based on probability, rather than seeking God for direction in your life down to the very details of what he's called you to say yes to. So what happens is we go, no, well, actually, I feel like God's called me to reach uh, the business world or to reach, you know, whatever it is. And so that must mean that he wants these things for me. But instead, what we're going, we're going there with presumption. But instead, what we should be doing is saying, Lord, whatever you've called me to do, I want to give you my yes down to the very details of what that looks like. That things are not holding my heart, that the only thing that holds my heart is your presence. And that if you give me something and take it away the next day or ask me to release it, that I can release it with joy, knowing that my source is not in my calling or in the things that you've provided for me, but actually in the provider who will provide for me according to my needs that are actually in line with what he's called me to do. Yes. See, prosperity and the abundance of the gospel is tied to the call of God upon your life. That's why Paul could be in one moment of abundance and another moment where in the natural it would seem like it was lack. And yet in the midst of all of it, he actually learned contentment and satisfaction because Christ became everything to him. That the, the riches and the treasure of heaven was, is, is found in the reality of Jesus Christ. And Jesus promises the rich young ruler, he says to him, you lack one thing. He's testing this man's heart. He's saying, yes, you've gone after uh, 
uh, you know, living out the, the, the law and, and you're trying to do the right things and, and you've ticked the boxes of what would seem like the right things to do based on what you feel called to do or, or led to do. But the reality is you lack one thing and it has to do with what's holding your heart. And he says, go and sell all your property. No, when we read these things, it's like Jesus wasn't saying go in and sell your car and it's okay in three months time, you'll see that I'll give you another one. But I just want to check if you'd give me your car. He said all your property and give the money to the poor. It wasn't even sell, sell all your stuff and invest it in an account and then follow me and, and you, the interest will just build. And eventually when you've finished what I've asked you to do, you can come back and get all of that. No, he said, he said sell it all and give it away. So this is before we see Acts, and this is we're beginning to see Jesus shaping these values, shaping a movement that he's building and that he's birthing. And what it's defined by is the worthiness of Jesus. It's the yes to follow him. He says, he promises them, he says, sell all your property and give the money to the poor and you will have abundant treasure. The, the, Jesus didn't just say, do all of that. And then, yeah, it's going to be a really bum time. And I'm sorry. And, and uh, you know, well, that's just the way it is. No, actually, he says, he says, sell all your property, give it to the poor, and you will have abundant treasure in heaven, which is of eternal value. This is way beyond having a house and a, and a car and a comfortable life and all these things. No, come on. This is the treasure of heaven. And then he says, and come, follow me, become my disciple, believe me, trust in me. What is he saying? Let me just, let me put, put it like this. Jesus is challenging his independence. He's saying you can do all the right things, tick all the right boxes, but following me requires dependence upon me. That if you, you're yes to me, you're giving me your life is not a, a prayer or an incorporated experience where you bring me into what you're doing. No, I need you to be 100% dependent on me. It's why he sent his disciples out and said, take nothing with you. Oh, Lord, I hope, I hope this hits our hearts just because I'm not, I'm not calling you to poverty. That's not what I'm calling you to. I'm calling you to radical obedience where the, the riches and the abundance and the prosperity of heaven can be upon your life for every purpose and, and calling and destiny and assignment that God has set you apart for. What he's saying is, will you trust me with everything? Because if you do, you're going to live a supernatural life. A supernatural life that was paid for at the cross. A supernatural life full of signs and wonders and miracles. The miraculous becomes normal. He's saying, if you'll, if you'll follow me as my disciple, believe in me, trust in me, and walk in the same path of life that I walk. That's what the Amplified says. Jesus is not calling us to anything that he has not walked himself. I'm just, that's important. Jesus never calls us to something that he has not walked himself. So if, if he's walked it himself and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, victorious over everything of all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And he's saying, I've called you to be co-heirs, to be seated with me at the right hand of the Father. Why would saying yes to him be so difficult? Only when something matters more to you than him. Only when your possessions and your riches and the things you've given yourself to matter more than the worthiness of Jesus. And Jesus points this out because it says the man was saddened. I mean, come on, Jesus just invited you to the most radical, supernatural, incredible life. And this man walks away saddened by the words of Jesus. And I want to say this, I think so much of the church today is too afraid to preach the gospel in purity because there's too many rich young rulers that we're afraid to lose. Too many rich young rulers that we're afraid to lose, afraid to see, walk away sad, saddened at the words of Jesus. And we are so insecure in ourselves, we're afraid to say it, to see them walk away saddened. But then one day they'll stand before Jesus and what they will feel is a lot more than sadness. And in fact, it takes it further. He was saddened and he was left grieving. Because he owned much property and had many possessions, which he treasured more than his relationship with God. Now, listen to this. Now, Jesus unpacks this moment. I mean, can you imagine as the disciples, this must be quite a confusing moment. Here's a man who just ran and fell at the feet of Jesus, and he was a rich man. And so you can imagine the disciples may have even got a little bit excited for a moment and thought, yes, thank the Lord, a rich guy is going to join the team. And we're going to get, we're going to stay in hotels and we don't have to camp out in the woods anymore. Now we can stay in fancy hotels. 
you know we don't have to eat bugs or whatever they were eating or <laughs> just fish now we get to have other stuff you know but no this this unfolds before them and they watch this where this man walks away saddened and grieved and jesus actually dealt with the situation from a place of compassion he looked at this man with love and compassion and yet had to say to him you need to go and sell everything it makes you think that the love of God, the compassion of Jesus doesn't always look like it's okay, settle for it, it's fine. I'll still take care of you, don't worry. It's okay, just because you can't give me your whole yes, it's fine, it's okay. You just carry on there and it's fine. I'll just, you can just, you're the exception. That's not the love and compassion of Jesus, right? So verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, I love that. Can you picture this? The disciples are going, what the heck just happened? We were about to get hotels. Now the guy's walking away. What did you do, Jesus? <laughs> and so he's looking around at his disciples. And he says, how difficult it will be for those who are wealthy. I'm sorry. I have to go there. There's just way, way too many uh, teachings and things out there. No, you know, wealth, you know, wealth and riches, you know, different. Wealthy means this. Riches mean that. I get you. I get what you're trying to say. Yeah, there's a difference between being rich and, and wealthy it means more than just money or whatever. But here's the word is wealthy. Okay. The guy was wealthy. And Jesus said, how difficult it is for those who are wealthy. So let's not just, let's not make a big weird message out of this and go, no, he meant rich. And all. he said wealthy, how difficult it will be for those who are wealthy. Just want to let you know, almost every single, probably every single person on this call is in the top 2% of the most wealthy people on the planet. So let's not read this and think about other people in our heads. <laughs> let's read this and put ourselves in that and go, okay, okay, Lord, that's me. Are you with me? Because sometimes we read these scriptures and go, you know, <laughs> Timothy, Mark chapter 10, you know, so-and-so, yo, have you seen how many cars and how many houses? They have a holiday home in Kenton. I know it for a fact. And then, you know what I'm saying? This is how we, now, if only they would sell their holiday home in Kenton and lay it at the apostles' feet, maybe we'd actually get to some nations. No, come on. Let's read this and go, wow, Lord, actually, I, I, live, in that, I live in that space. I'm a, there's, there may be many different kind of uh, levels to that, but the reality is, you know, if you think about globally, the, the level of, of life and living and, and where people, the poverty line and where people are actually living we are very, very wealthy people. And so he says, how difficult it will be for those who are wealthy. And the Amplified says this, and cling to possessions and status as security to enter the kingdom of God. How difficult it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. I said again, how difficult it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Let's just settle it. It's difficult. Why is it difficult? Because the possessions, the money, the things that we have in life are screaming at us all the time. When you don't have them, that voice isn't speaking to you. But when you have them, that voice is speaking all the time, every day. We live in a system that is driven by being led by those things to have them, to sustain them, and to make sure that you get more of them. And so if we live in a system that's driven by those things, those things are screaming at us all the time. They want to dictate to you how you live your life possessions and money and and the way of this world is screaming at you trying to dictate how you make your decisions and what you give your yes to that's why it's difficult it's difficult because although the desire of your heart might be to just say yes to the one thing there's about a million things every day that are demanding your yes and what they will do is make themselves of utmost importance and so it's it's interesting the devil doesn't make it he doesn't go, yeah, you know what, I'll just throw a whole bunch of things at you that really mean absolutely nothing, have zero importance, you know, matter nothing to you. Uh, I'll just throw those and see if, if that affects your decision. No, what he does is he, he elevates these things to a level of importance in our lives, and he makes them something that actually matters to us. And suddenly just saying yes to Jesus becomes really difficult because what we want in our hearts is surely there's a way for me to say yes to him and yes to other things. It's the desire of our, of, of our hearts when we're stuck. When we're stuck and we, we haven't given ourselves fully to Jesus, it's like, but surely there's a way for me to say yes to him, but still be able to say yes to the things that I really want to say yes to. Or I'll say yes to Jesus. I just need to finish my yes to this one and I'll get to him. The disciples were amazed and bewildered by his words. Just like you guys are on the call right now. And no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> bewildered as well. But Jesus said to them again, 
children. Oh my word, he said it again. Can't get away from it. It's like Jesus just goes, yeah, I said it. You're bewildered and shocked. Let me say it again. If Jesus repeated himself, then it doesn't get more clear. Do you know what I'm saying? Like we could just, let's just read the Bible and go, okay, wow. Let that one just hit us right in the face. Okay, yeah. it's difficult. Children, how difficult it is for those who place their hope and confidence in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man who places his faith in wealth or status to enter the kingdom of God. Oof. Now, I love this. They were completely and utterly astonished. <laughs> so they went from amazed and bewildered. He repeats pretty much the same statement. And now they're just completely and utterly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved from the wrath of God? <laughs> Maybe that's, you know, I don't know about you, but you read this and you go, that, that's, the, that's the right response. He says it twice. You look at yourself. You go, well, we aren't really living in poverty so, well, who can be saved? If this is the reality, if it's difficult, then what the heck are we doing? Because we're all struggling. We've all got these opportunities to fall into this. And so they asked this question, who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said, with people, as far as it depends on them, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Mm -hmm. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, if you, if you will obey me and follow me, I said I would give you the treasures of heaven, that you would come follow me, be my disciple and live the same life that I'm living, that you would come and follow me. Look at my life. Do you see lack in my life? Do you see poverty in my life? Do you see that I'm, 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 I'm not ruling and reigning in life, that I'm actually losing? No, I'm not losing. Suffering is very different. I suffer for a purpose and a cause, but look at my life. I'm living a victorious life. I'm inviting you to be a follower of victory. I'm inviting you to be a follower of the supernatural power and presence of God. With man and your own understanding and perspective, it's impossible. But with God, with God, it's possible. Would you follow me? Would you give me your yes? That's what Jesus is saying. And then I love Peter. <laughs> I, I, I get Peter, man. Peter, Peter, I feel like Peter's my guy because he, he's just, his response is like, I read the word and it's like what, he's, what he says sometimes is like, I just get that. That's what I would have said. Peter started saying to him, look, we have given up everything and followed you, becoming your disciples and accepting you as Lord. It's like, Peter's going, hey, Lord, did you, have you noticed? Hey, we did follow. We did say yes. I gave up everything. You saw I left the nets. I left the boat. Just, just make sure with clarity here, I'm saved, right? <laughs> this is Peter. I, I relate to that. It's like, and then Jesus said, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, I love this. This is so beautiful. Listen to the great shepherd, how he leads people. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, there is no one who has given up a house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake who will not receive a hundred times as much now in the present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be lost and the last first wow, wow. Jesus just literally opened up an open heaven revelation of the kingdom of God right there in that moment. You got Peter going, holy moly, you just said that it's going to be difficult for us. Who's going to be saved? Uh, then you explain. And then Peter goes, well, Lord, I gave everything. You, you saw that. Please, dear Lord, I hope I make the cut. <laughs> I gave everything to follow you. And then Jesus, like the perfect shepherd that he is, speaks to their hearts. And he says to them, I assure you, most solemnly say to you, there's no one who's given up all of these things that will not get a hundred times more. And I love this a hundred times as much now in the present age. And then he lists houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions. Mm -hmm. And in the age to come eternal life. Mm -hmm. But then verse 31 is the punchline of exactly what he's communicating. And this is how we'll go back to Ananias's fire, but many who are first will be lost and the last first. I won't go there now, but in, in John 1, I think it's 49, story of Nathaniel, where, you know, Jesus, well, actually, I'll just read it to you really, really quick. John chapter 1. Uh, from verse 43, the next day, Jesus decided to go into Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me as my disciple. Now, Philip was from 
their side of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one uh, we have found the one Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote about Jesus from Nazareth, the son of Joseph, according to public record. Nathanael answered him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip rep replied, come and see. Jesus uh, saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, here is an Israelite indeed, a true descendant of Jacob in whom there is no guile, nor deceit, nor duplicity. Hmm. Nathanael said to Jesus, how do you know these things about me? And Jesus answered, before Philip called you, when you were still under the fig tree, I saw you. Hmm. Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Jesus replied, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe in me? You will see greater things than this. Then he said to him, I show you, most solemnly say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Here's, here's Nathaniel, or some believe Bartholomew is, was his other name, good old Bart. <laughs> and, uh, and here's the difference between the rich young ruler and good old Bart, right? His yes. Here's good old Bart who's going, can anything good come out of Nazareth? This does not even make sense. And Jesus encounters him, gives him an opportunity to behold. And Nathaniel goes, you are the son of God. Everything that I am, I'll follow you. I'm, I'm in. And that's all Jesus is looking for. And we see that same thing when we go back to Acts chapter 5. We see the same thing with the difference between Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira. You've got two hearts here. You've got one that is just a simple yes to the worthiness of Jesus. I will follow you with my life. Everything that I have is yours. And you've got another one that is wanting to participate in something that is so beautiful and powerful, but with a selfish agenda, with the attitude of self-gain and without submission, without humility, and without yielding to the dream of God. Very clear. You with me? So when we read this, it's supposed to position our hearts in a place to recognize, have I allowed the gospel to penetrate the deepest places of my life and my heart, to completely invade and fill my life, to, to dictate how I live my life, what I give my yes to, and how I make my decisions. I said it on Sunday, have, have I come to a place where I've allowed the Lordship of Jesus to invade every aspect or expression of my life? Are there areas in my life that I'm living out of presumption based on a probability that I think God would want me to have that or do that? Or have I taken the time to seek him as Lord of my life and made decisions from a place of obedience. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And I'm just being honest with you. When the Lord did this, you know, in my heart over the last little while, it was like, I just had to stop for a second and look at every area of my life and just go, Whoa, how quickly I can get wrapped up in my own agenda, how quickly I can get wrapped up in my own desires, my self nature, how quickly I can begin to, push for things and go after things out of probability that, well, I'm pretty sure that that's what God's saying. I'm pretty sure that that's what he wants. I'm pretty sure that, that it must be that it seems like it was unfolding that way. So it must be that way. And then suddenly you get brought back to this place of humility where you go, oh my goodness, have I been seeking the Lord actually as Lord of my life, yielding to him as Lord to say, Father, I just want to obey you. What are you saying right now? What, what have you called me to give my yes to? Because when I do that, I become a faithful steward that he can trust with more. And that's what he said to Nathaniel, to good old Bart. <laughs> he said, you believe because you've seen this amazing work, but greater things you will see. Greater things. And it's the people of God that give the yes that will see the greater things. Sure, I want to stay here so much longer, but I think that's a, a, a decent overview of Ananias and Sapphira and just the heart of what God is, is dealing with and talking about. And then I want to show you what's the result of, of this culture that's being birthed in the church here. Verse 12, Acts chapter 5, verse 12. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders attesting miracles were continually taking place among the people. And by common consent, they all met together at the temple in the covered porch called Solomon's Portico. Just there's a the good scripture to just smash uh, the, the, the correct version of church is only house churches. Uh, wrong. Read your Bible. Uh, and then there's other scriptures as well where if, it's, if we say it's only big halls and auditoriums, uh, wrong. Because when you read your Bible, you'll see that it's public corporate gatherings and in homes. That it's everywhere we're supposed to invade, but we must gather. So here we see the church gathering in a big corporate area where thousands of people could get together in Solomon's portico. 
Okay. But none of the rest of the people, the non-believers, dared to associate with them. However, the people were holding them in high esteem and were speaking highly of them. Really powerful scripture. Not just this wishy-washy, easygoing, flippy-floppy, come in, go out, do what you want kind of movement. Actually, the fear of God was upon people. When they looked at them, they held them in high esteem. Well, these people are radical. They're crazy. These people are selling stuff and getting things done in the nations. But it's the fear of God is there. I don't just, I don't just jump into this thing. I don't just, oh, yeah, I'll just throw my little uh, small Father Christmas contribution or my little gift. My, no, actually, am I in or am I not in? It's an it's a all or nothing. It's not a 50-50. It's everything or nothing. It says more, I love this. So listen to this. Just because that, that non-believers and those that were afraid dared not associate with them, but were holding them at high esteem. That doesn't mean the church wasn't growing because the next scripture says more and more believers in the Lord, crowds of men and women were constantly being added to their number. So there was more saying yes than there were of those who would dare not join. There was more giving Jesus their yes. That's what the gospel does. The harvest is ripe. People are going to say yes to Jesus. Many, many, many thousands and millions and billions of people are going to give Jesus their yes because he's coming back for a bride that is radiant and beautiful, clothed in righteousness, fully given to the worthiness of the lamb. We must have an expectation that we will see more join and give Jesus everything than those that stay away in fear. But there will be those that cannot handle the weight of, of the transformation that's coming in their life when they give Jesus the yes. And we have to recognize that. We're not trying to make it easy for people. The gospel works for itself. Our job is to be communicators, demonstrators, and carriers of the gospel, but the power of the gospel does the work. It's the Holy Spirit in us that draws people to the Father, and there will be more and more believers in the Lord, crowds of men and women that are constantly being added to their number. To such an extent, I love this, to such an extent that they even carried their sick out onto the streets and put them on cots and sleeping pads so that when Peter came by, Sorry, I get so undone by this because Peter's the guy who, who messes up. <laughs> Peter's the guy who I, I told you why we relate. It's like Peter's the guy who just, he's just always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, getting in the way. Uh, he's just so zealous, so passionate. He's so, he's so desperate for Jesus that he gets it wrong. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in that place where you, you're just so you so want him. You're so hungry. You're just like, Lord, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I must have you. And because of that, it's like you're actually this clumsy, all over the place, just stumbling into things kind of believer. But the reality is Jesus so loves the heart of Peter because Peter's prepared. And I, I'll tell you why, why I relate to this. Peter's prepared to humiliate himself at the risk of getting closer. He's prepared to humiliate himself at the risk of being what Jesus is talking about. So, so Jesus is teaching his disciples and suddenly he goes, guys, I'm going to go and die. And Peter gets up and goes, not a chance. Am I going to let that happen? You just taught us what you're trying to do. There's no ways. I, 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 I can't let you die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for your mind is on the things of man, not on the things of God. And there's this moment where you can think Jesus is like, geez, Peter, you're always in my way. No, Jesus is training and discipling and leading Peter. But what I love about Peter is he's prepared to risk and embarrass himself for the purposes of just trying to be what Jesus is building. Yeah. And then he's, you see his human frailty and his brokenness where he denies Jesus three times and he weeps and he's broken. I can picture Peter after that just going, I tried and I tried and I tried. Lord, I, I want to be everything that you've called me to be. I'm so desperate to see your kingdom come, but I just, my, my human, frail, weak brain just cannot get it. I just keep missing. And then suddenly he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's the guy, once again, who's prepared to risk it all and stand up with the 11 and preach the gospel and preach the sermon and see the gospel move. And, he's the, and you see again later on in Galatians, he makes mistakes again. And what's his response? Off I go to Rome. I made a mistake with the way I treated the Gentiles. Off I go to Rome. I'm going to go and base myself at the center of the Gentile world and serve them and love them and give my... This is Peter. And so what I love is here's Peter who has so positioned himself by just being a radical yes to Jesus, giving his life, everything that he is, even if he makes mistakes, it's like, Lord, you must have all of me. And it's Peter who positions himself under the shadow of the Almighty 
that he is overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, that his, his own physical shadow begins to heal the sick, that Peter's walking along streets and the sick are getting healed. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, Peter was so rocked by the presence of Jesus, the goodness and the faithfulness of his presence, that he was walking and seeing signs and wonders and things breaking out. And he was going, Lord, I can't believe this. You are so good. You are so incredible. The power of the gospel is being demonstrated through extraordinary people that, that are only extraordinary because of the Holy Spirit in them. But they are extraordinary. Peter was an extraordinary person. He was extraordinary because of his yes, not because of his ability and his strength. He was extraordinary because he gave Jesus everything. And God then anoints that and goes, come on, I'm going to change the world. And so here you see Peter. Oh. So it says, to such an extent that they even carried their sick out onto the streets and put them on cots and sleeping pads, so that when Peter came by, when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on one of them with healing power. And the people from the towns in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing the sick of those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all being healed, all being healed. See, Jesus is not looking for a rich young ruler who ticks the boxes. Jesus is looking for everyday common people who maybe don't even get it right most times, but are so desperate that Jesus would have everything. It's the, I'm telling you right now, he is raising up that Mary of Bethany company of people who they don't know much. They don't know much in terms of, I don't have this all figured out altogether. I'm not the guy that's, that's just, you know, got the way. Or, no, I, all I know is the good portion. I know how to sit at his feet. I know how to throw myself before him, to listen, to look at him, to be so sensitive and aware of what is he saying? What is he doing? You know, the reality is Jesus was, he was surrounded by a whole bunch of people when he said three times, I'm going to die. But one person recognized it and prepared him for burial. One, one who was really listening. One who was really watching, one who was so sensitive and alert to what he was saying and doing that she was listening. She began to realize by the third time it was like, oh, my word, he's, he's the one. He's going to die. He's going to do this for us. And she comes in to a place where she's not meant to be. Why? Because she's prepared to risk the embarrassment to make sure Jesus knows, I want you to have my all. This is the gospel. It's, it's like, Lord, I'm prepared to even do the wrong thing in a sense that I'm coming into a place. I'm not welcome. I'm not meant to be in this room right now, but I need you to know, Jesus, you need to have my all. You need to know that you have my all. Everything that I have, my most expensive asset, I break it. I waste it on you, Lord. She didn't go, let me go and sell this so I can sow some, ministry, some money into his ministry. No, she broke it on him to say, you are worthy. You are everything, Jesus. I need you to know that you are worth more to me than I could ever waste and pour out on you. And it's this Mary of Bethany company because Jesus says, wherever the gospel is preached in all creation, this story will be told in memory of her. In other words, Jesus elevates her right to the center of the gospel message and says, this is what the gospel is all about. Her story is going to be told along with the preaching of the gospel because what it looks like when I've captured your heart is a Mary of Bethany company of people that will give everything, that are not ashamed to suffer the cost because it's worth it. It doesn't feel like a cost when he's worth it. It only feels like a cost when we don't know his worth. It only feels like a sacrifice when we don't understand his worth. But when we know the worthiness of Jesus, what a joy, what a privilege it is to waste my life on him. So then it's like, well, what's this garbage about, uh, you know, oh, I, 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 um, if I don't understand or I'm trying to figure things out or I'm, um, I'm upset with the, the state of the church, or I'm, I'm upset with things, or whatever. So no, I'm, I'm not going to sow, I'm not going to tithe, I'm not going to do anything. No, the reality is, come on, it's the worthiness and the beauty of Jesus. It actually has nothing to do with what even happens with what you sow. It has to do with your heart. Is he worthy? Have you seen him? You know, the reality, I'm saying this because the reality is we've got people across the world. I'm not talking, I, I know 24-7 is a group of generous, radical, beautiful people. I'm saying across the globe, we have got people that think like this, that my, my generosity is based on the benefits of what I get from this or my understanding or what actually, come on, he's worthy. 
And this is the reality is we don't want to see the church settle to be a bunch of Ananias and Sapphira. We don't want to be a bunch of people that have duplicity and hypocrisy in our hearts where we, we sing like we've said yes to Jesus. But the reality is on my terms. It's not the gospel. It's not salvation. It's not what Jesus paid for. But the reality is there is this beautiful, raw, simple people. And I'm telling you now, the Mary of Bethany's of this world are not a group of people that have it all together. It's okay. It's okay to maybe look at your life and just go, sheesh, wow, there's a lot of work here, Lord. I know I look at my life, I can see I need the gospel. That's Peter. Peter's going, I'm nothing. I'm a failed fisherman. I'm struggling just to make ends meet. I'm struggling just to actually get through life. But I've found the one who's worthy and I need him to know that he must have everything. He must have all of me. And when we get to this place as the church, it's like God's heart for people who give that kind of yes. He just, he can pour out the abundance of his power and his favor and his goodness. And suddenly signs and wonders break out and he takes people like Peter and people like Mary of Bethany. And he says, it doesn't matter that you did the wrong thing. The reality is your heart is giving me your yes. You're so in, you're so invested. You've given me everything that I can trust you with the treasures of heaven. I can trust you with glory. And so now you've got Peter walking around. Number one, he never had to go back to fishing because Jesus provided for him. <laughs> and then not only that, but he's walking in the glory and the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit that even in his weakness and his frailty, just his shadow is touching people and they're getting healed. I just, I so believe that at, at this time, why we're going through the book of Acts is because if we will just catch this, if we will catch the simplicity of what the response that Jesus deserves in our lives, he deserves it. We, we don't have the right to even question whether, well, I, you know, how, what does it look like? And should I be doing this or that? No, just stop it and look at him. Because when you look at him, suddenly you realize there is only one response that he deserves. There's only one response and it's everything. And his own disciples, I want to encourage you, you can even be near Jesus and still not understand the right response. You can be even one of his disciples that are in the room sitting there. And the question that's going through your head is, what on earth is she doing? We could have been so much more effective in the ministry with that. But the reality is God is looking for this company of people that see the worthiness of Jesus, that he will use as the vessels for the, the, the advancement and the, the the fulfillment of the great commission on the earth. We are going to see his kingdom advanced and finished on the earth. We are going to see every tribe and tongue come around the throne and worship him. We are going to see him return. We're going to stand before him. This is the reality of our lives. This needs to be more real to us than my daily struggle of trying to make ends meet. What, what is that in comparison to eternity? And when I see it with that perspective, when I see it through that lens, he must have all. And I have to wake up every day and position myself in this place. The Lord, you must have all. You must have all. I cannot. You are too worthy for me to live a mundane, normal day where I do not give you everything. You are too worthy for me to get wrapped up and sucked up into the things of this world and to miss my opportunity to love you in the way in which you deserve. And it's not legalism. It's called passion. It's called being in love. It's called this, this raw, uh, uh, a deep desire to minister to the heart of God. It's the new covenant priesthood of people that are just obsessed and madly in love with him because we've seen him. And Jesus takes that people, and that's the Jesus people. Jesus takes that group of people who are in and of themselves a bunch of failures, misfits, disappointments to themselves, but not a disappointment to the Father because he looks at the simplicity of their adoration and devotion and love for him and he says that's all i'm looking for because if i have your attention i can transform your life if i have your attention i will change everything about you that you do not like the things that you know are not are not what you were created to be if you just give me your attention i will make you like me i will make you what i created you for in the beginning See, it's, it's a people like that, where you read the rest of chapter five, where they begin to preach the gospel and they get arrested and they get threatened 
I'm told you're not allowed to speak this message. You're not allowed to say it this way and whatever, whatever, whatever. And they say, I love their response. Wondering if I should just read some of this. You know, let's, let me just show you the supernatural power of the gospel when you just give him your yes. It says here in verse 17, but the high priest stood up along with all his associates and they were filled with jealousy and resentment. They arrested the apostles and put them in a public jail. Now listen to this, verse 19. This is what I mean, but when you just give Jesus your yes, you find yourself yeah, in difficult situations, but look at the supernatural. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and leading them out, he said, go stand and continue to tell the people in the temple the whole message of this life. See, it's when you're fully given to him that you're not looking for comfort, you're just looking to obey. See, obedience, when it comes from passionate adoration and being in love with Jesus, it's not about what the result is going to be for me. It's about ministering to his heart with my obedience. It's about the fact that you've been given the ability to move the heart of God and please him by simply obeying. That when you obey him, you move the heart of God. You minister to him. You bless him. You excite him. So here they get arrested and the angel of the Lord comes and frees them. Supernatural intervention. And guess what happens? The angel of the Lord frees them and says, go back to where you were when you got arrested and continue to preach the gospel. Now, and listen to what he says. I love this. Go stand and continue to tell the people in the temple the whole message of this life. This life that you've come into. This life that you are now living in. This yes that you've given to Jesus. Go back to where you were preaching it and preach the whole message of this life. This is the gospel. Why do we go? Why do we go? Because Jesus went. When they heard this, they went into the temple uh, about daybreak and began teaching. Now, when the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the council, even all the, the council of elders of the sons of Israel, and sent word to the prison for the, apostle, uh, the apostles to be brought before them. And when the officers arrived, they did not find them in the prison, and they came back and reported, we found the prison securely locked and the guard standing at the doors, but when we opened the doors, no one was inside. Now, when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these things, they were greatly perplexed, wondering what would come of this. But someone came and told them, the men whom you put in prison are standing right here in the temple area, teaching the people. <laughs> I love this. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them back without hurting them because they were afraid of the people worried that they might be stoned. Jeez. So they brought them and presented them before the council. The high priest questioned him saying, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in his name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Then Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. Why? Because I'm given to him. I'm in love. I must. I must. I cannot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to you. <laughs> I'm sorry that you're not Lord. <laughs> I'm sorry that you're not the king of glory. I'm sorry that you wish you were. But the reality is I must obey God rather than men. I've been given to him. I've seen him. He, I am an eyewitness of his glory. We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. And God exalted him to his right hand as prince and savior and deliverer in order to grant repentance to Israel and to grant forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has bestowed on those who obey him. <laughs> I, I, want to, I want to explode. I want to just literally burst because I just go, come on. Are you hearing it? Are you seeing it? It's like, we just got to read the gospel again and again and again. We should spend so much more time here because this is where we'll come alive. It's obedience. Why is it obedience? It's not obedience because we're trying hard like the rich young ruler to meet the requirements. It's obedience because I know nothing else but to give you everything. My life is not, it counts for nothing if it's not yours. 
Why would I do anything else but give you my yes? I've seen, my eyes have been opened. I recognize that this world is of no value if it's not in Jesus Christ. I must live in him. He must have everything. I must be like Mary of Bethany, like Peter, like those who have given everything. And for generations and generations, for 2,000 years and even before, but for the last 2,000 years, there's millions and billions of testimonies of people that have given Jesus their yes, names that you'll never hear until we get to eternity, names and faces of people that have paid the highest price, martyrs of glory in the kingdom that have given their lives for this one thing, and we will meet them one day in heaven, and they will look you in the eyes and say, isn't he worthy? Isn't he worthy? We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has bestowed on those who obey him. He bestows the Holy Spirit on those who obey him. You know, we wonder why we're not seeing the, the baptism of fire and power like we read about. Well, it's because we find it so quick and easy to say, yeah, you know what? Say a prayer. Let me dunk you in some water, lay my hands on you and hope that you get some tongues. And then we just call that baptism of the Holy Spirit. No, actually, have you given him everything and are you prepared to obey? Have you fallen in love with him? Are you, are, you, are you ready to radically obey Jesus and follow him no matter the cost? If he wakes you up tomorrow and says, sell everything, give it to the poor and follow me into this new place or this new region or this new, and go and risk your life and preach the gospel. Walk into that business meeting and tell every single one of them this word of knowledge. Sell, or, or, uh, you know, sell that asset, lay it at the apostles, whatever it is. Are you willing? Are you ready? Because that's where God goes. I want to bestow power upon you. I want to bestow the spirit of Jesus upon you to do what I've called you to do. Because your heart's positioned to follow me. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Sheesh. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Um, um, I've got one. No, I haven't got a minute. It's 8.30. So to explain this next little passage so that we don't have to read through it, you can read through it after this, but what, what essentially happens is there's a man named Gamaliel who basically says, listen, guys, if this is God, we shouldn't touch this. And it'll prove that it's God because we'll see that God will move on this. It'll, there'll be longevity. It'll, it'll last long. There'll be fruit. And if it's not God, it'll fizzle out and, and die. It'll be this movement will end. We need to be careful here. This could be the Lord. We need to be careful. This is essentially what he's saying. And in verse 40, it says the council took his advice. And after summoning the apostles, listen to this. The council took his advice, and after summoning the apostles, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. It's like even, see, that's a victory. I don't know how many of today's Western Christians would see that as a victory because listen to what happens. They flogged them, ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, released them. So they left the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for the sake of his name. And every single day in the temple and in homes, they did not stop teaching and telling the good news of Jesus as the Christ. I think what we need is more believers reading their Bibles and saying, Jesus, make me this. I don't know the, the how and how to do this right and how to tick the boxes, but I do know that you deserve everything and I must give you my whole life. You are too beautiful, too worthy, and too magnificent. The price that you paid for my life deserves everything that I am. I must give you everything because then it's not so much about the result of what it's going to look like for you. It's making sure that he gets the glory every time. That even when your victory looks like you're getting flogged and released, that I counted a joy. I can rejoice to say that I was counted worthy to suffer for his name. And that it's seen as a victory in my life. And that is Acts chapter 5. <laughs> See, when we read the word with the Holy Spirit, there's reverence and anointing and power because what he does is he illuminates the word inside of us and says, this is who you are. I've called you to be this. I've called you to live this. These letters were not just recorded for 
historical value or, or relevance. No, th these were recorded to motivate you and to light you up and to guide you as to who you are and what you're called to live like. And that this was just the beginning and that there's greater things that we're called to walk in. And so I just, for myself, I know that I am daily gripped by the reality of his worth. And I'm challenged when I look at areas in my life and I can see I need, I need him to invade those spaces. I need the face of Jesus to shine. And I need to allow myself to yield every single aspect of my life so that he will be Lord in every area of my life, that I have the time to seek him uh, for the details of those areas so that the expression of my life is the right response, the, 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 the correct response to his worth and his beauty. And I, I know that I, I may be sharing this with an intensity. Um, and I was talking to Damien and he was encouraging me saying, you know, it is wounding sometimes, but it's, it's the right kind of wounding. Because I want you to know when I share this, I'm wounded in the right way. I'm wounded by the beauty and the, the worthiness of Jesus. It, it should grip us to a place of like, I, I have to give you all. I must, I must throw myself at your feet. And so I want to encourage you tonight to hear this, not as a, as a, as a chapter of the Bible that puts a heavy weight on you, but to motivate you to say, he is so worthy. He is so beautiful. He must have everything. There is nothing else in my life that can justify itself to be elevated above his worth. I must make sure that there is not a single area of my life, and I include your spouse and your children. Because he didn't just say farms and houses. He said brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers. Now, I believe that Jesus is all about healthy marriages and the right parenting and, and godly families. And I believe in all of that. I'm just saying to you, sometimes we elevate things above his worth. And we make decisions based on other things in our lives rather than the lordship and leadership of Jesus in our lives. Instead of giving him our yes, we kind of tolerate and have a desire to participate on our own terms like Ananias and Sapphira. And then we never get to walk in the finished work of what he called us to walk in. And we miss the manifest glory of God in the church. And he's inviting. See, we've come to a time. Ananias and Sapphira was right at the beginning when there was mere thousands. Now we're at a time where there's billions. But we want that weight and level of glory upon the church. We do not, God's not going to slaughter billions. So he, he waits and he draws us and he woos us and he's calling the church to respond. And I want to encourage those of you that were there on Sunday night. The reason why we saw what we saw on Sunday night was because everyone in the room said yes. Because there could have been a few in the room that said yes, and they would have had a beautiful encounter with the Holy Spirit, and he would have met them in that room. But the reason why we saw a corporate uh, encounter with the glory of God was because everybody said yes. Everybody went in. And if you were there, you know what I'm talking about. We, we saw the, the fire and the tangible glory of God upon us. The joy hit us. The angel of joy was in that room as Gerard released after that encounter he had. And we saw what began to happen. And I want to say to you tonight, it's not just for meetings, it's for your life. Throw yourself at the feet of Jesus. Let him have everything. And you're going to walk in glory and in the wonder of his presence, a supernatural life, a life fully given to him. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray tonight that you give us grace to yield, grace to say yes. And if there, if there, are, if there are us, some of us, Lord, who know that, that sure, we hear this and we go, Lord, again, I find myself without words, but with nothing but a longing and an ache. Like Peter, where I'm, I might not be getting it right, but my heart is throbbing and aching and bursting to give you everything. Lord, I know that I might be falling over myself a bit clumsy in my response and in my actions and how I'm trying to navigate this. But Lord, I ask that you fill me with your Holy Spirit like you did with Peter, that, that what anointed him to live the life that you called him to live, Lord, that you would do that in us. And we say, Lord, I, like Mary of Bethany, everything that I am, everything that I have, I, I pour it at your feet. And I say, Jesus, you must have all. You must have all. You're so beautiful. You're so worthy. And one day I will stand with the multitudes in eternity. I will stand in the throne room and I will look at my brothers and sisters of all time. And we will look each other in the eye and say, isn't he worthy? Mm -hmm. 
And again and again, if I was to relive my life on the earth, I would give myself to him extravagantly every time because he's so beautiful. He's so worthy. Lord, I pray that we would see the worth and the beauty of Jesus and that tonight you would completely conquer us, Lord. Conquer us. Conquer us as the people of God. Let there be nothing left but a yes to you, Lord. Lord, heal us of our misunderstandings and, and misrepresentations that we've believed, of our self-agendas, our own goals, our own aspirations, our own dreams. Heal us of the self-nature. Thank you, that, Lord, what you did on the cross is you redeemed us from that, that we can crucify those things and be resurrected in new life into what you've called us to. And I speak this, Lord, I, I speak the, the breath of God, the ruach of God over every single person right now. And I see it, Lord. I see the wind of the Holy Spirit around our minds, liberating us from doubt, liberating us from, from the, the thoughts that we're just not called to have, but bringing us back to the simplicity of loving Jesus, the simplicity of worship. Lord, make us a worshiping people, we ask in Jesus' name. Lord, I bless every person on this call. Lord, I speak such an increase in your presence and your anointing upon their life. And I thank you that tonight, Holy Spirit, you're wooing us closer to you. You're wooing us, drawing us, inviting us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your dream made alive in our hearts. Wow. And God, I pray, Lord, you know every single one of these people, what they do day to day, whatever it is, whether it's at their workspaces or the, the tasks and the mundane everyday things that, are, that happen every day. Lord, I thank you that you would invade those times. And I ask tomorrow that you would already begin to move and work in them, that whatever they have to do, Lord, I thank you that it would be submitted to your leadership and your lordship and that every area of our lives, we would seek you. We would seek you for your leadership. We would seek you for your guidance, that we would allow you to be Lord and to govern our yes in Jesus' name. So I release the revivalists, the reformers and the dreamers of the kingdom of heaven. I release them tonight. I release them tonight and I say, run, run with fire run with a boldness that comes from the hope that's in the permanent glory given to us by Jesus, not something we've earned or attained, but run, 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 run as carriers of the presence and the glory of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Lord, I bless the beloved tonight because they are beloved. I bless them, sons and daughters of the Most High God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in our hearts, in our lives, and in every expression of who we are. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And we get excited about what this is going to look like. And I, I can't wait, Lord, to see the, the life stories, the testimonies that get ignited by the simple truth that we read of in your word. I bless you, Holy Spirit. I love you and I honor you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So I want to I want to encourage you tonight. I'm sorry it's, it is longer than we've been most um, Wednesdays, but I just I really felt the Holy Spirit just come upon us tonight in His Word. And um, you know, when I was in Turkey, the Lord said that He was going to teach me three things, and one of them was how to read the Word. And I promise you, when we read the Word with the Holy Spirit and we make Him the very center of what we're doing. It comes alive in a way that makes you just, it demands a response. It demands a, a, a response to what you're reading. It, it can never be a story anymore. It can never be just a quick encouragement. And so I want to say to you, get into the word, read this again and again, take chapter five and read it over and over and over again. And so I know it was a, <laughs> yes, I agree, Beth, hectic, but thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I know it's a, a heavy, it, not heavy, it's weighty. It's weighty because it's pure. And sometimes because we've settled for a life of so many different things, when purity comes, when the purity of Jesus is ministered to our hearts, it, it cuts a little bit. It wounds us. And that's okay. I want to say to you, it's okay. What you're feeling right now, the weight, it's okay. Let him do that in your heart because I promise you, it comes with joy. And it's joy that strengthens you. See, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Why is it your strength? Because what happens is there's first conviction and revelation. And then when that, there's an enlightenment that happens in your heart where the Holy Spirit comes and he floods you with light, he ministers to you, but then he fills you with joy that strengthens you for what he's called you to do. So I want to encourage you, take this, 
feast on this and then let him minister the joy that comes with the gospel into your heart and you'll begin to see fruit in your everyday life.